Allard is stepping in. Court department, is that? Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Mike. I know, we're, we're matching tonight. I sure wore my striped shirt. Right. Right. I'd like to uh, call to order the meeting of the uh, Summers Board of Selectmen, October 20th, 2022. It's uh, 6 p.m. And uh, I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. With regards to uh, roll call, we have on uh, my right is uh, 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 Selectman Meyer, on my left is Selectman Schmidt. Uh, we also have uh, on this table next to us uh, Brian Wissinger, uh, assistant, director, assistant, finance, assistant Finance Director, correct? Yeah. Mike Marinaccio, uh, CFO. We also have Todd Rowland, Director of Public Works. Allison Mayers, uh, Director of Human Services, Gary Schissel, Assistant Fire Chief, Keith Allard, Deputy Fire Chief, Kim Liddy, Police Administrator. Uh, any public comment this evening? I don't believe we have any members of the public that want to comment. Is, is that correct? No public comment. Presentations by first selectmen. Just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, October 29th is the uh, drug take back day that we're providing, the town is providing services to be the uh, receiver of drugs that people want to get rid of out of their medicine cabinets and they no longer need. It's not good to flush them down the toilet. That doesn't work. That's a huge problem. So it's drug take back day. It's going to be Kibby Fuller. Um, and it's from 10 in the morning till 1 in the afternoon. So, just alert everyone to take advantage of that. Uh, second thing is uh, election day is coming up on November 8th. Uh, polls will open at 6 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. as usual. Absentee ballots are available at the town clerk's office and uh, they need to be, once they're filled out, they need to be received by 8 p.m. on Election Day. And the third thing I want to mention was the, uh, the community center survey. We, the results, the survey ended on this past, this Wednesday of this week. And we had the town received over uh, 700 responses, which is about 18% of the surveys that were sent out to all, all, all households in town. 18% is a great, uh, doesn't sound like much, but it, it is, it, that is very high with regards to surveys that responses towns normally get. Uh, so we're going through those responses and we'll come up with uh, a better understanding of what the public's interested in in the next few days. Thank the public for responding, very important. Uh, and with regards to the community center proposal, um, I, along with the committee, which is comprised of seven people, visited the Wyndham Community Center, which includes Willimantic, this past Tuesday, spent two hours there with their uh, resource uh, recreation director, or assistant recreation director, and their uh, town manager and we learned an awful lot and lots of lessons learned that they shared with us and I got to see their facilities it's a brand new community center that's just opened in April of this year and uh, it, was, it was time well spent 
those are my comments. <coughs> Consent agenda, boards and commissions, appointments, and resignations. I don't think we have any of those. None that I'm aware of. Opportunity to add urgent items. Does anyone want to add anything to the agenda? No. Okay. Finance, uh, transfers, and appropriations. Uh, we have one appropriation tonight um, for the Potential contract with Stafford uh, for paramedic services. Um, we do the appropriation with the contract. It seems like it would be the most logical. Yeah, I and mean, I obviously can't sign the contract or or agree to terms in the contract until you have the monies in place. Um, we agree to a contract and it fails at town meeting or vice versa. I would, I would make sure I had the money before I agreed to anything. My recommendation. Yeah, and, and you're going to the board of finance. Uh, board of finance Tuesday. Tuesday. Right. Um, That'll be a topic on the agenda. Uh, it's up to you guys to get your decision on, on the uh, the appropriation. If you want to discuss it now, or if you want to wait until you get to that topic item and do it at that topic item uh, with the contract. That's I mean, I got some questions, items to discuss, obviously. I mean, I'm fine either way, whatever you guys decide, but I just, it seems more tied to the contract, so um, whatever you want to do, I'm fine. But I do have some things. Okay, we'll, we'll just set it aside until we get to the contract. That's fine. I'm, okay. I'm, ready, I'm ready to vote now, but we can wait. Okay. okay. <coughs> All right. Anything else? Nope. That's the only right. appropriation. Thank you. Uh, CFO's uh, report. Yeah, I got a few items. Um, uh, today we received, or yesterday actually, we received our what we was called GASB disclosure statements, GASB 70, 67 and 68. GASB is Governmental Accounting Standards Board. This has to do with the pension plans for the volunteer fire department and for the town. Uh, the disclosure statements really make up a very significant component of the footnotes in our annual report. Uh, and so it's all public information. Uh, but I'll just give you some highlights. Uh, we also had a meeting earlier today of the pension committee itself where I just gave them the highlights also. Um, how, how does the public have access to this? Is, is uh, well, when the annual report comes out, and we'll, we actually will put, put this up on the web page. There's no problem with that. We'll put this on the web page. <coughs> um, and then, again, like I say, the there is a lot of uh, actuarial uh, mathematics in here that most of the public will <laughs> not want to navigate. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I'll give you some of the highlights. Good. The yeah. highlight pages. Thank, thank you for just said that. I said that for a particular <laughs> reason. So. Um, the town uh, has funded ratio of for the plan is 102.69%. That's gone down from last year, which was 120%. And you can understand why that's starting to move in a downward trend, but 9%. Last year it was 128.6%. Uh, the other thing is the investment returns, uh, for the first time in nine years, we're showing a negative investment return uh, in both accounts. Um, for the town account, it's down 8.28%. Last year we had a 28.11% increase, so that's quite a swing. Uh, you can see the markets have been, you know, tumbling in a way. Um, and much then the markets have fallen much more than 8.2%. Yeah, they, they have, and, 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 and if you were to listen to our investment advisor and, and, and the information he gave us, we are definitely um, our loss point is a lot lower than um, many many towns. Some some go as high as 25 percent. This is the fiscal year you're talking about. Uh, um, yes, we are. We're talking about the fiscal year, fiscal 22. Yeah. Uh, the volunteer fire uh, fund investment return went down 6.17 percent, uh, and last year they were up 29.06 percent. So um, this this disclosure has a nine-year history in it so anybody could actually see what we what we have made from year to year so uh, 
The other item I have is... Mike, what was the, uh, just on the pension, what, what was the status of the um, managed provider that we were hiring to oversee the pension payments and stuff? Yeah. What was the status of that? Has that been implemented? And oh, it has been implemented. Um, so they're issuing payments now? They are issuing yeah. payments uh, yeah. monthly. They're um, filing the state and federal taxes. Okay. Um, and that was as of July 1 that went into effect? As of July 1. Okay, yeah. good. So <coughs> that brings me on to the next topic. Um, the pension committee today voted um, to amend their existing investment uh, policy, um, which originally was, uh, I think the last time it was really amended was in January 2015. It was again reviewed in 2019 with no changes made. And now it's been reviewed and amended in October. And one of the more significant pieces of that is an appendix which explains everything about um, the, that that agency that we used to, to conduct all those payments. So um, they voted to approve that. This, the chairman is going to sign that. They're sending it on. They're going to send it on to the selectmen. When it, I, I need to get it in final form. It's kind of like in red line right now, uh, in italics. Um, when we get the final form, we'll, we'll, select, we'll give it to the selectmen, and then you will need to uh, have a motion to authorize the first selectman to co-sign that. Uh, The, um, what else we have? Um, the auditors have completed their field work here this week. Um, so um, their on-site work is completed. Everything from this point on will be, will be handled remotely. Uh, we still have work to do. Um, there's a number of things we need to tie up before we can actually uh, uh, move, move forward. Uh, there really haven't been any findings of any dollar value there have been some preliminary discussions about um, changing or updating some policies, not the financial policies, but maybe our purchasing policy, um, because we are now moving into an era of federal funding. Yeah. We want to make sure we harmonize our purchasing policy with the federal policy, yeah. because in many instances they are different. So we have to make sure that that. Um, Tim, you covered the senior center. Um, and then earlier this uh, week, we sent out the um, quarterly report. I don't know if you had a chance to see it. Yeah. It's kind of chock full of info. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, I mean, we don't have to spend the whole time talking about it here or anything, but, but feel free to contact us or stop by and talk about anything in there. There's, there's a lot of things that happened in that first quarter. Yeah, I was very impressed with the way it was laid out and presented. And uh, Yeah. yeah I mean, it not only talks about the, what's going on in finance, tax, assessor, but it also talks about all the all the committees that we are uh, in, that we interface with and that we're uh, the, uh, the uh, and it, that we deal with. And there's, well, there's like five of them, so there's seven. quite quite a bit of activity there. Seven of <laughs> them. So, okay, seven. Yeah. <laughs> Who's counting? Yeah. Okay. Count. Who's counting? Okay. So, so I guess the question was we had when we had the meeting there with. Uh, you know the attorneys about you know legal fees and everything. Uh, we were given a preliminary estimate, I think, by seventy thousand dollars that potentially could come out of all those uh, court cases. And you're saying here at this point that it's almost fully expended already. Is that before that seventy thousand? Yeah, okay. of course it is. Okay. That seventy would have to come before you. Yeah, that would come before you. For an appropriation. Okay. Yeah. Just, just this and then, and then in a town meeting. Yeah. All right. Just so we, we decided not. We decided to move through that gradually, if, if you recall. That yes. Based on the, the pace of the, those expenses, we'll then decide how much we need to appropriate and when. So okay. Thank you. Is that it? Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, no, nice job. Nice work. Very good. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is updates from boards and commissions. Payments. Oh, I'm sorry. Payments. I always skip over that. Payments. Authorization of payments. We need a motion for the total of uh, $370,266.41. I would be happy to make that motion. Second that. Any uh, discussion? I, I've reviewed these myself and asked Brian a couple of questions during the day, but 
Okay. Yeah. I didn't yeah. find anything yeah. unusual. That's good. Great. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Sign it. On the agenda is uh, pending business. Our last uh, meeting on the 6th of October, we talked about uh, possible act, discussion of possible action on the Stafford paramedic proposal. And uh, there was a suggestion that we might need some additional language to uh, cover the uh, contingents the event, if, if the event occurred where someone else showed up with a, uh, the R5, the, the ALS, uh, PSA R5 license, uh, that we may have to, uh, it may cost the town some money to discharge the person that has been hired to fulfill those uh, duties for town uh, summers in light of the fact that there is someone else that has the, li that someone that has the license that would obviate the need for our services. I uh, asked John Roach to uh, get back to us with regards to uh, that subject, and he said basically sent an email to myself, and uh, she sent the email to Brian Wissinger, copied me, and said uh, we we confirmed uh, we confirmed that the contract already has language in it that requires a 60-day notice if Stafford wishes to cancel the agreement. After some follow-up discussions, we feel that 60 days is more than adequate for Summers to be able to take advantage that may be necessary regarding this position, including uh, possible uh, reassignment or layoff if necessary. Further, we do not feel it would be appropriate for the contract language to dictate what our town should or should not do with the town of Summers employees after the contract ends. So, uh, and again, reviewing the contract itself, which I think you have a copy of in your, uh, the proposed contract, which you have a copy of in your uh, documents, does say this agreement uh, may be terminated by either party at any time for any reason uh, by giving written notice of 60 days to the other parties, meaning that if, if there are, is someone hired by the town of Summers, uh, Number one, if it's within six months, the person is still on a temporary uh, hiring status. And then if it's after six months uh, and the person could not be reassigned somewhere else in the department, the person could be laid off and the thinking is that that could be done within, uh, within the 60 days that's covered by the obligation of Stafford to uh, make good on their payments. So I, from my perspective, I, I don't see any reason why we need any additional language. Um, well, number one, I think um, Chief Rhodes greatly, once again, has oversimplified things. I mean, to give the solution is we'll just lay them off. I mean, that's not how things work. It's not that simple. You know, there's a whole legal process for layoffs. The town's liable for unemployment. I mean, there's there's a lot of implications besides, oh, it's simple. We'll just lay the person off. You know, it's. It's well, a big the question is whether the layoff procedure could be accomplished within 60 days. That's the issue. It's in but even then, it's our employee we'd lay off. We'd be liable for the unemployment. We'd be liable, you know, there's a state notice required. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that have to happen to lay someone off. You don't just give them a pink slip and walk away. But I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because I have a few other points that I want to, that I want to bring up. I think number one, my question, is what's our plan, our long-term plan? And I don't think I've ever heard that. You know, I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of mixed things. I mean, I'll just read a couple of them. Um, you know, this is the, the letter that was sent in with the Trinity applications. Um, you know, the Town of Summers resources have been providing ALS coverage to the Town of Stafford since ASM pulled out. 
Summers paramedics have been trying to fill the gap. However, there's no formal agreement. Summers never intended to cover Stafford indefinitely. Um, you know, then the, the article that, that he wrote for the newsletter, you know, well, about neighboring point, departments. Those points that you just mentioned are all still accurate. Okay. Well, that's what I wanted. So, um, Summers, you know, we routinely send our equipment and members to neighboring communities. This mutual aid and regionalization of efforts been more efficient, more effective. Um, you know, I didn't have to write an editorial to tell people this isn't mutual aid. You know, we went out of town 900 times. Other people came into town 25 times. You know, it's a little bit lopsided. So I think that's my first question. You know, what what's the long-term plan? You know, I found out that, you know, his statements last time were not accurate. My statement was accurate. You know, Stafford does not have the ability to apply for the R5 right now. They, they, they don't. They, they have filed it. They, they have. And their, their application they did, is... They did it about two months ago. Okay. And I'm their correct. application is sitting uh, at OEMS. Months. They have no standing to file it because under the regulations, they're not a paramedic service. And by law and by regulation, only a paramedic service can apply for an R5. So OEMS will not even consider their application because um, they're not a paramedic service. And that's, that's state law. So I think they got some bad information from a, a low-level um, person. But I think that there's some bigger issues here. If I may on that item first. Go ahead. Uh, so I spoke with Chief Rocha tonight, and he stated that Stafford Ambulance can apply for the R5 as long as someone is providing ALS coverage. 24 hours a day. That is not my understanding. It's, so this is the well, problem. We are providing coverage 24 hours a day. Well, that's a different. So now, if Summer's going to guarantee 24-hour day coverage to Stafford, that's my question with the plan. We provide 24-hour day coverage now, right? And now we are looking at putting someone over there permanently for eight hours a day, right? Seven days a week. Forty hours. But a week. we still have to cover the other time frame. For Stafford. For Stafford. Why? As well as for Summer, because it's a mutual aid contract. It's we not mutual aid. We provide mutual aid. Though. We don't. We provide mutual aid by going I to have staff. never Whether seen... you call it mutual or not, okay, we still have to go over there when they call it. We cannot say no. Yes, we can. Okay, so I think number one, the problem is your entire source of information is cheaper. Of course it is. Okay, and he's not giving correct information. That's the first issue. Okay, and I've done my own first-hand research as recently as yesterday, and I spoke to an attorney about this, okay, and confirmed what I just said with Stafford's application that it is not being considered by state public health because they don't have the standing to file it, okay? So his information is wrong, and Stafford, I think, was given some wrong information, okay? And I've confirmed that firsthand, okay? Um, for the other issues, I think that's my conversation as far as what's our plan, okay? We've been providing, I agree with you, Chief, we've been providing the service to Stafford for the last two years. We have bought the equipment to service Stafford, the third paramedic vehicle, third set of gear, and we have staffed, increased our staffing to cover Stafford, okay? We have provided coverage. We do not increase the number of paramedics. We did. Or anything we like did. That. We hired an additional paramedic. We hire paramedics to cover all the hours. We do not have multiple paramedics on duty to cover Stafford. We do. We do, and I'll get to that in a second. Not 24 hours a day, though. Not 24 hours a day, but I'll get to that in just a second. So I think that the concern is summer taxpayers buying the equipment and going to Stafford. We built up our staff and we built up our equipment to service Stafford. And I think that's going to play out when finance finishes their analysis. We generate very little revenue in Stafford. Okay, very little revenue. We have, no, we have the numbers on it, yeah. yeah. Okay, well your numbers aren't, the numbers that Chief wrote for that are not accurate. Okay, so the, we're talking we about... Numbers. I believe you got numbers from we did. EMS services. We did. We did. We, okay. did. we did. And it was 100. Okay. It was, Stafford was 130,000, almost 131,000. That okay. was what we got from the billing company. It was 118, I think, to 120. Well, you can argue with what it says on his paper. 131, but that's, that's gross revenue. You have to remove their billing costs. They received nine and a half cents of every dollar they collect. So the net is about 118. dollars 118. So it's a complicated conversation, but you have to remember that we always receive revenue in Stafford. Okay, because we've always done BLS calls. So the net change because of paramedics that we staffed up for, that we bought the equipment for, for Stafford, is about, I think, 70-something, 70 78,000, the change in revenue, BLS versus ALS, because that 118 is all the revenue, including BLS. That's not my understanding. That is just that is ALS. 
No. No. That is BLS. Sorry, I spoke. Oh, 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 you're correct. Oh, you're correct. It's partially BLS. Mm -hmm. It is mostly A. Well, more than 50%, I would agree with. But I think that as far as the additional revenue goes, it's somewhere between 70 and 80,000 due to ALS intercepts on well over 400 calls. You got to keep that in mind. You know, $70,000 on 400 calls is not very much money considering how much money Stafford made on their BLS transports, the profit they made, and how much money we've made total in summers. Okay? Where do you expect to, I guess my question is, do you really expect that our costs are going to drop because we no longer service Stafford? We are, we are, yes. we are putting a person in the firehouse 24-7 as a paramedic to cover summers primarily, and they also cover Stafford. We do not put two How many paramedics are you putting on? At a time? Yeah. Typically one. We have a lot of times where we have three on. We have a chief whose role is primarily to be the chief, not to be a paramedic. We have periods of time where we think that the, um, the volume dictates two, but that is not typically the case. It is one. So when you start to go from six o'clock at night until six o'clock in the morning, it's definitely one. That's all we okay. have. So when that paramedic goes to staff for two and a half times a day, who's here in summers to respond to a 911 call that comes in? The chief during the day is here to respond. I'm saying it's 10 o'clock at night. It is secondary role. It's 10 o'clock at night when you said we just have one medic on. Who's here to respond? If I call 911 because I'm having chest pain, who's here to go to my house? We are going to have to call another department if that's the case. But we also go okay. and look at the numbers, and the numbers are astronomically higher now for the ALS coverage that we're getting than we were ever getting before. Because we're going out of town. Because we're going out of town. The numbers in the summers have not changed much. Of course they have. Not because much. We were at approximately 70 to 75 percent of the times we would call ASM for a medic that they would provide us one. Now we're at 95% plus. Well, but Enfield had a, had an availability, I think, when you combine Enfield and ASM together. I, 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 I think this is getting outside of the scope of what we're trying to do, which is okay. just to uh, uh, basically um, agree to uh, forward the uh, paramedic proposal to the Board of Finance for their review at their meeting next Tuesday evening. Okay, so I'll cut to the chase then. So I guess my recommendation, what I'd like to see, is that we approve the contract. Because I think the contract's fine, and I've said that all along. Um, Except for the language that you insisted on. But we're going to get around that, because I have a solution. <laughs> so I don't think we need to hire anyone to staff this, because we've already been staffing to cover Stafford. And I'll, I'll show you in just a second, because um, I've illustrated it. But I think uh -huh. that we sign the contract, use the existing staff, bring the entire money that we're getting from Stafford to reimburse our summer's taxpayers to make this right. And we already have the staff on to cover them. I mean, how many paramedics are we going to have on during the day? Let me show you. I mean, the, the assumption that we're going to hire this person to begin with because of the volume being increased over, okay. time, over time. Well, we just heard. Which continues yeah. to increase. Yeah. Here, I made a few copies. Here. This, I spent 15 minutes last night. Um, that's how long it took well, again, again, I, I, we're, 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 I'll just pass on the on the proposal first, which is on. The well, no. Let's take a look at let's take a look at our current staffing. So, Brian, how many full time paramedics do we currently have? Uh, and not including the chief. Not including the chief. Um, I believe five, might be six. Six. We're funded for six in the budget. Yeah, we're funded for six. We we're, so we're six currently six funded for have, six. We don't have six yet. We're currently no, funded we for five. six paramedics. We have six in the budget. So we currently gave an appropriation for six paramedics, right? Correct. So under the current contract, they work a two-week cycle, right? So 48 hours in one week, 32 hours in the next week, right? They work 24-hour shifts, our paramedics. So I illustrated out for you the schedule. So the top line is summers, right? We have one medic on all the time. Medic one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? You can see how we got plenty of medics because they only work one or two days a week, but they cover 24 hours. Then you see how, because of the opposite week, you have the eight hour block of kind of team B. So you have team A, which is medic one, two, and three, and you have team B, which is medic four, five, and six. So when you build out the schedule, I know this is kind of how they already do it, you see in every week, there's already extra time built in. So you already have 16 hours of medics two time on Thursday that's extra, and 16 hours of medic um, three time on Friday that's extra, okay? now. Also keep in mind, part-time hours, Brian, how many part-time medics do we have? 
two on staff was an open position. So we have three. So we actually budget 36 hours a week of part-time staff. So this doesn't even include our part-time paramedics who work during the day for 36 hours. Plus, it doesn't include our chief, who's a paramedic, who works 40 hours during the time that we're going to be covering staff. So, you know, I think pretty clearly here, we can illustrate, and I know this is the current case because I have backup documents from the chief saying that, we already staff three medics during the day, 40 hours a week. So why are we going to have four on? We do. I'm not aware that there are three medics in the department. Okay, and that's a rare occasion. We do not specifically look at staff three medics. Well, if we had six medics, we would. I don't know. I don't see anywhere in here you've taken into account time off. Sure. Training, things of that nature? Well, because I underestimate. So we have 36 hours of part-time per week, every single week. So that's 72 hours of part-time coverage that takes in time off, training, plus we have the chief's time. And he did 100 ALS calls since January 1st. That's so that shouldn't be his primary duty. It shouldn't. I agree with that. But I don't see a need to hire another person. Because then where are we going to put them? we got so many medics already funded. We're going to have four medics on? I mean, has anyone ever looked at this? It seems to me, Schlepp and Meyer, you're trying to undo something that we've been working on here for two to three months. Why wouldn't we agree to the, why wouldn't and we agree to the so agreement? I think, first of all, we just need to vote on this language, uh, this proposal that uh, we want to pass and uh, make ready for uh, consideration by the Board of Finance uh, next Tuesday. So I'm in favor of the proposal, but not the appropriation. So let's vote on the proposal, and then we can we vote on the appropriation. Motion to... Yeah, I can make a motion to uh, vote on the uh, written the staff paramedic, paramedic proposal. Paramedic proposal. I'll second that. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. So I think this relates to the appropriation. I don't see any need to rush an appropriation through. In fact, I don't need to see any need to have an appropriation period because we're already overstaffed. And I, I think this I was like maybe, maybe first of all, we can maybe, maybe Mr. Wissinger can, maybe Brian can respond to that with regards to uh, what it is we're trying to do and whether even if uh, appropriation is authorized by uh, the Board of Finance, whether we need to spend the money. Um, so if we are planning to create a new position, yes, we would need to appropriate money. If we are going to honor the contract with current staffing, we would not need to appropriate any money um, because we budgeted everything. Um, so to Bill's point, I mean, th that would be an option if you wanted to take in just the full amount of revenue um, and not, I mean, if you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 you have eight full-timers and not hire a ninth, you know, or create a ninth full-time position. Um, you have one vacancy right now in full time. This would create a second vacancy in full time. Um, well, let's make it clear that's not all paramedics. It's all paramedics, right, except for <coughs> we have two, two that are not and seven that are paramedics. Yeah, you'd have seven medics and you'd have Glenn and Ray that are the only two full timers that are not paramedics at that point, or even currently. Um, one could argue I mean, it could go to Board of Finance and yeah. pass, and it could fail at town meeting, and you wouldn't. That's it true. could go to Board of Finance and fail, and you still wouldn't get the appropriation. I mean, one could argue, rather than jumping into the deep end of the pool, you might want to start out in the shallow end, and as you start to provide the service, and you realize that You're running this short kind of budget. schedule is not working out, or there's some kind of snags here, then you would yeah, make the appropriation and easily enough do it with a special well, wouldn't it put us in a stronger position though to have the appropriation uh, approved by the Board of Finance to begin with? Gives us additional options. As if you're looking to create a ninth position, yes. Otherwise, that's what we've been, that's what we've been working on for the last three months. I mean, well, is our point I'm not to sure staff staff I'm not or sure, to add more bodies? I'm not sure we're prepared to change our, our approach at this stage of the game, and I don't think it's appropriate. What do you mean change our approach? Meaning, you don't think we need an appropriation? I don't think we need to hire someone. And if you don't need to well, hire someone... Well, that's your opinion. Well, where's well the we chief? haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten agreement Well, the on chief that. has already made that recommendation several times, correct? Correct. Well, because he wants to keep building and building and building. I mean, he's... It is, it is to hire a single person paramedic to be the chief on staff for five days a week. 
Yeah, which, which is what we've okay. been talking about for three months now. So now we're going to have two medics in Summers, three medics actually with the chief, one medic in Stafford. So we're going to have four medics working with three sets of gear and we do 1.5 calls a day in Summers. Bill, unless you show me who's been running every single day, I am not going to sit here and say that we've had three, three paramedics. Well, okay, I'll read you an email from the chief. We do run with three medics on shift roughly 40 hours a week, including myself. So the third monitor would allow us to safely operate at this level. This is what the chief told me in writing. Okay. Is that okay. well, he includes himself. himself. Include himself. Okay, well we only need two. We need one in Summers and one in Stafford. And we got an extra, which is him. So we got one in Summers, one in Stafford. Do those, do those 40 hours match the contract hours? Of course it does. Of course it does. What year by least? I mean the hours that he has those paramedics working. Well, I think we should okay. look at scheduling that. If it doesn't, I'd be happy to meet with them to make sure we're operating as efficiently as possible. Because I don't see, I mean, this is a pretty common sense schedule. I don't know anyone's ever looked at it. That's your version. Well, <laughs> this is something we can do sometime in the future, but at the time, for the time being, I think we need to move this appropriation uh, request along. We have a lot harder time if it fails the Board of Finance or the fails at a town meeting convincing people it's legitimate. I mean, why don't we do our homework first and then come back and make the, if we have the contract, we can move forward with the service and let's get the chief here to explain. Well, I, I, think, I think if you do that, then you further delay possibly putting someone on, yeah. right? We want to start January 1st with this. Right, and this is okay. to the town. How long will it be if we have to go to the Board of Finance and then we don't go to the Board of Finance this next meeting? How long, how much longer will that be? We will not make a January 1st deadline and we still have to hire somebody. Who, who are you gonna hire? If that's approved. Who are you gonna hire? I mean, you still have to hire somebody in town. You still have a vacancy in town as well. Yeah. Okay. I believe the chief has an interview on the 28th of October. So, Mr. Keeney, I, I think I'm in favor at this particular point to agree with you and to appropriate the $62,522.75 that Mr. Wissinger uh, proposed to. So we need a motion for that? Yeah. Okay. I would be happy to make a motion to uh, do the appropriation uh, transfer request of uh, $62,522.75. And I'll second that motion. Uh, it's open for discussion. Any further discussion? I think I said what I had to say. I don't think we need it. I think it, we should wait. We're jumping the gun. Let's hear an explanation as to why this doesn't work, this schedule, why we're not following it. it follows the contract. I mean, I've done scheduling and public safety my whole for 20 years. I mean, I know this well, so I'd love to hear the chief's explanation as to why it's not working with current staffing and why we need more. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Nay. Great. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, gentlemen. Next on our agenda is the uh, discussion uh, under pending business is discussion of the elimination of services at Trinity Healthcare. So, since our last uh, meeting, I had an opportunity to uh, speak at length uh, with Bill Morrison, uh, Selectman Sal Titus. Bill Morrison, who's the uh, Deputy Chief, West Stafford Fire Department. Sal Titus, who's the first selectman uh, for Stafford, and with uh, Stu Rosenberg. And I'm not sure exactly what his official title is. Is he the, the CEO for CEO Johnson? Yeah. Johnson, it's not Trinity Healthcare. It's yeah, it's Johnson, I think. Just Johnson Memorial Hospital. Yeah, yeah he's not Trinity CEO, right. he's local. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, just, I looked it up the other day, I think that, yeah. Okay, and, and, and after those uh, lengthy conversations, which took a little well over an hour, including all three of them, uh, I better understood the meeting that was held by, uh, hosted by Bill Morrison on the 6th of October, the same time we had our Board of Selectmen meeting, which is why we couldn't attend. But the purpose of the meeting was, it was not a public information meeting. It was a meeting with 
public officials and local officials uh, for the purpose of Trinity Healthcare explaining why they were uh, reducing, why they're proposing to reduce services for obstetrics uh, and patient care, ICU care, and emergency surgery to a limited degree. And uh, it was not meant to be a meeting uh, to include the public and, and uh, the bully and, and in discussions with Stu Rosenberg is basically is that uh, as a result of the October 6th meeting, uh, Trinity Healthcare is reevaluating their strategy. Uh, so I think, number one, uh, the purpose of, of a meeting, any meeting with the Board of Selectmen here, and by the way, it wasn't, it wasn't a Selectmen's meeting in Stafford, even though all three Selectmen were present. Because they were there, they were able to com comment uh, individually if they had any comments or ask questions. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's premature for us to schedule any kind of meeting with uh, Trinity Healthcare just because it uh, seems to be somewhat of a moving target, and they're uh, reevaluating their strategy, their position, and uh, however. Uh, Stu Rosenberg did say that you know, clearly he intends to uh, uh, discuss whatever they do come up with, with uh, obviously boards of selectmen, with uh, senior centers, rotary clubs, uh, those kinds of audiences. And, uh, so we, we talked last week about possibly scheduling some kind of a meeting on the 27th of mm -hmm. October, and it doesn't seem, if it was going to be a meeting, it would be basically a meeting with, uh, with the three of us, the Board of Selectmen. I mean, I've talked to him. I think I understand what his current position is. I know Bill has talked to him. He knows yep. what the position is. The only person that hasn't talked to him is Selectman Schmidt, and I encourage you to talk to Stu Rosenberg. You did a good job explaining some of the notes to me, so that helped me a lot. Yep. Um, and uh, and it's just it's not... It's, it's not at this time really right to sit down and bring them in and have some kind of meeting when the public is not invited and the only other officials I can think of are, are Chief Roach and who else would be. Uh, I mean, I, I think that, again, the problem is that, that the, uh, the proposal seems to be changing in light of the October 6th meeting with the public officials, who included, which included, um, let's see, uh, Senator Champagne uh, <coughs> represented it, uh, Councilwoman Chairman and Tammy Nuccio, uh, a couple of fire chiefs, uh, Congressman Courtney, so state watch, uh, state assistant, first selectman Eaton from the Union, Sal Titus, uh, Kurt Bale, and uh, Rick Hartenstein, who is a selectman in Stafford, Ellington first selectman, Lori Spielman, Bill Morrison, and, uh, and Bill was the host for the meeting. So that, that's just my opinion. Uh, what do you think? I agree with your assessment. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. Got that, that covered. So we're going to cancel what we had thought to do next week. And yeah, right. We, or at least postpone. We hadn't, we hadn't yeah. really said anything. Yeah, about. well, at this point, there doesn't seem to be any need because really yeah. they're, they're kind of up in the air. But they're, right. yeah. And, uh, and, the, and the fact of the matter is, they aren't ready to go public with anything yet. So they, even though there have been newspaper articles yeah. written and statements made. Well, I think it's good you reached out again. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I think to, to let. Trinity know and also our Stafford counterparts know to try and clear this with us would be helpful. I mean, they literally held it during our meeting right. when all of us aren't available. So, right. I mean, it'd be nice if it was held on a night where we could just do it together. Right. You know, would be would be helpful. I, it was done inadvertently, obviously. They didn't think about it. But now that you've reached out, hopefully it'll be on their mind. And maybe we just make that request that they clear it with us before they... I would certainly hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Even if all three of us can't make it, but at least, I mean, on the night we have the meeting, none of us can make it. Correct. So, yeah. 
<laughs> okay, uh, next on the agenda we have uh, Director Maynard to talk about uh, a, a hire that she is proposing. Good evening. So, as you're aware, we have ARPA funding allocated to provide counseling services to youth. I believe the one primarily doing it since April 2021. Um, so, this would uh, add additional hours for kids to receive um, individual counseling and group therapy at City. Um, so, I'm proposing that we hire Erin Gately. Um, she has about five years of experience doing clinical work directly with children. She works at Trent and Johnson Memorial um, in the adult behavioral health unit. But prior to that, she was up at Trinity Health, at Providence Health, uh, Behavioral Health Hospital in Polio for several years. Um, she's a licensed master's level social worker. She lives in town. She's very eager to serve her community. Um, I think she'll be a great fit. Um, and like I mentioned, it'd be awesome to see a so far. And, and what happens when the ARPA money is, uh, I mean, how, how long is the ARPA money available? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, my original proposal um, was to pay a higher rate and bring in um, a, a licensed clinical social worker. So we lowered the rate and are bringing a licensed master level social worker. Um, so we'll actually be able to stretch this out for quite a while. Now, I don't know how that's going to when we have to spend ARPA funding down by, but yep. we could keep Four it consistent for several years at, at just this. Um, it's, it's a cost of about 19 grand a year, and I have 132,000 specifically for therapy. So I mean, this is a kind of a seed where this could turn into a billing model or something else as well to make it kind of self-sustaining in the future. Um, <laughs> I did that. Um, yes, it can, and um, not to put too much pressure on myself, but I um, can actually just work with you to get all my paperwork into the state for me to get my LPS tested, so I just got approval. Um, you know, it's a matter of passing the test, but once I have my LPSW, we can bring on interns, we can look at the billing model that Stafford has, um, it, will hope that it will open up like a whole host yeah. of options that will cost little to nothing to the county. And then Stafford's case are actually a revenue generator. Chris, we need a motion to uh, hire. Make a motion Aaron to uh, approve the hiring of Aaron Gately as a part time clinician, 10 hours a week, at the hour rate of $50 an hour, as recommended by Human Services Director Allison Maynard. Effective, what's the third date? It's pending background check right now. And, uh, Do you want to put, uh, we could put a date maybe a week. For that Monday, whatever that is, after the week from Halloween. So, when does the payroll be? The 31st? Uh, or the one after? So, November 7th? Uh, November 6th is the next payroll. Period. Okay, so effective November 6th, 2022? Okay. Great. Right. Sounds good. A second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 I just have it, thank you, it's passed. Uh, I asked Allison, because of all the different things going on in her department, and all the different revenue sources, uh, much of which is coming from other than some taxpayers, I thought it would be helpful for us to understand better uh, what her department is doing, uh, how it, it has brought on new people, anticipating additional people, and what are the additional services that are being presented to the Summers community as well as to our adjacent communities? Thank you, Alice. Thanks, Tim. So, I knew I was going to talk. I actually made a couple of tweets to it, but nothing significant. Um, so, our mission statement, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, you know, we're dedicated to providing holistic services to promote the well being of Summers residents. So, pretty much anybody in town can come to us for any reason. Um, if we're not just serving low-income residents. Um, we service all sorts of different um, residents for all sorts of different reasons. Um, social services was our core department that was based out of the senior center, got pulled out for the kidney that you guys hired me to do uh, three years ago is to run the social services department. 
Since then, we've brought on youth services, um, and now we're going to be enhancing our prevention services, which is under the local prevention council, um, Summer comes together. So the social services overview that you guys have before you, that kind of just a brief high-level overview of the type of services we provide. Um, when I ran stats for FY22, uh, um, we provide just under 1,000 services to about 300 households. So, wow. you know, many households will see a couple times a year for various reasons. For example, a family might come to us for energy assistance, and then they'll come and get clothes for their kids for that school, and then we'll see them again for, um, you know, the holiday program. Um, so, um, in the past three years, we've just been kind of spent as far as social services go, just enhancing relationships. For example, we created this Kinletic, an internal referral for the police, or an internal referral form for the school system, um, just trying to really increase our outreach to residents, make sure they know who we are, what we are, and how we can help them. Um, but no changes to the real core programming of social services. Um, youth services is by far, you know, the newest um, addition to the, the human services. Um, so we received that funding for the first time ever, um, July 1st of 2021. It's a really big deal for our community. You know, Stafford had been receiving, um, Stafford is on now. Um, <laughs> 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 um, but they were great to work with, and, you know, they agreed that, yes, they, so they, you know, worked with me and the lobbyists to say, yep, summers you deserve to have this YSC funding and establish your own youth services bureau. And they had been seeing our kids and our families at right. their mental health clinic. Um, but so uh, we were able to start receiving that money and now we'll receive that money indefinitely. Um, as long as it exists, we'll continue to get it as a community. Um, and that's all through uh, DCF. So the Department of Children and Families. So about the a Aiden is running that program? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yep. A Aiden Connors. And where did she come on board just recently? Right? Awesome. Yeah, so she came, she came on board as an intern. Um, we just kind of got lucky, and, and she approached us about interning with the department. So she was with us all of last year and assisted to be our paid staff in May of 2022. Oh, great. So, all right. so what, about 28000 a year for your services? Uh, thirty two is what we pay her in okay. No, I'm saying for the oh. youth, the grant. Oh, yeah, I have that in there. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get the all the funding first. But yes, it's about, it's about 20 years. That's coming up. Okay. So yeah. just a high level overview, once again, of programs and services. We're providing counseling, case management, positive development programming. We now sit on the juvenile review board. Summers has no representation from the mental health services side. Um, we always had our SRO going to that, but we never had anybody from school for youth services because we didn't have a youth services department. So we now go to that every single month. Um, we also have established um, uh, with uh, the school system, they'll send kids for truancy now as well. Oh so that's really? our case with the Department of Education. There's mm -hmm. a standardized yeah. form. The kiddo has been absent more than 10 times. Instead of filing for educational neglect, the idea is that they go to youth services, get some wraparound services and support to try to help figure out what's going on, why the kids not going to school, to avoid the DCF involvement. Um, and then we're working on piloting a mentorship program with uh, to be able to be Avery. Um, so that's just a, the next page is an overview of services that we provided in FY22, just some of the programs that we ran. Um, kind of a fun one was our adventure program. Um, that was a clothes referral program for kids through the school system that just maybe needed a little extra support. Um, some positive peer interactions. So we went kayaking and to a rope course and we did like five different trips throughout the summer with them. Um, husky ticket project, that's a fun one. So just give away three husky tickets. They approached us and said, hey, <laughs> so this is a nightmare to manage because I get like thousand emails asking for the tickets and then like the last football game within like 10 minutes, they were yeah. gone. But it's cool because then there's this huge group of summer residents in the stands together and they send yeah. the pictures and they have a great time. So, um, yeah, so there's stuff like Great. that that's just kind of fallen into our lap, um, yeah. which is which is awesome. Great. And just a nice thing to provide for our residents. Um, okay, so prevention services is by far, you know, uh, the place I'm putting most of my energy right now. So um, as you're all aware, we got the Drug Free Communities Grant, $125,000 a year for the next five years. Um, our prevention coordinator position is vacant. 
Um, we have been recruiting for about a month. We have no viable candidates for that position, so that's mm. a bummer. Um, we got the salary, I think, good at the competitive level. I just think it speaks to where we're at in the climate um, for hiring new staff in general. Um, and it's kind of a niche job, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I'm confident we'll find the right person. Um, in the meantime, I'm moving forward with just, you know, survey, talking to the superintendent about the surveys that need to be happening yeah. in schools and just trying to work on the groundwork kind of stuff. Um, until we get that person. You're getting positive yeah. feedback from the superintendent. Oh, good. good. Um, and of course, ever since together, I would be remiss in uh, acknowledging that they've been around forever. They kind of, they set the stage for me to then be able to have a really, uh, you know, uh, competitive grant um, that is the reason we got our Joe Street Communities funding. Um, so we're going to continue doing all the basic stuff that we've always done with our take back day, community outreach, alcohol traffic compliance check, which we just did. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, yesterday <laughs> on uh, Penn Stewart and how it's uh, the Department of Education uh, services. Uh, and uh, oftentimes they're primarily related to the school. <laughs> So one, and one of the reasons you got this uh, drug-free community grant, which was exceptional to begin with, was the fact you had a strong foundation of existing programs yeah. that have been ongoing, and you've got experience and statistics. And, uh, and we have a great a group plan. of, yeah. you know, the, the summer comes together. You have to have all 12 sectors represented to even apply for this grant, and those sectors are police and fire. You know the school system, and we all we actually got compliments from Wyndham. They came to our last meeting, and we really do have all of the mechanisms in place to really do amazing work with this grant. So I'm really excited. We just gotta find the right staff person. Um, so I love it. and almost done. Um, the funding sources. So you know, social services entirely for that general fund, um, <laughs> and then youth services. No taxpayer dollars. We could argue. I guess. DCF's open to raise your tax dollars, but um, not at the, at the local, local level. Yeah. Local tax dollars. Uh, no local tax dollars, right. So, yes, yeah, so we get $29,783 annually from DCF, which helps mm -hmm. to offset aid and salary, but it's also our programming money um, to do stuff like the adventure program and stuff like that. Um, we recently, as you know, got, um, signed a contract um, with Stafford and Ellington, um, them giving us money. Um, but, but only five grand, um, but that helps once again to offset Aiden's salary. Um, and she is now providing case management services to the juvenile review board, um, which is great. So kids actively involved in the juvenile review board. Um, once again, there's a huge gap with our JRD. Um, and so the fact that now we can follow up with kids, offer deep treatment intake before they come before the juvenile review board, because um, in most cases, it's not a one-time incident. Um, it's, it's the one time the kid got caught. So there's other work that can be done with the family. Um, there's all that ARPA funding, the 132. I misspoke. I have 93,000 for counseling services. Um, part of the aid and salary is also paid out of ARPA at 99,000. Um, and then we piloted a camp social worker this past summer as well. With our and then the, the prevention services, so we get a tiny amount of money from the, the state, the LCC grant, that's a standard, it's based on population, you can't ask for any more, it can't get any less, it just is what it is. Um, the SOAR grant is optional, it's an opioid focused grant, we usually do apply for it, and then now. SOAR stands for? Um, state Opioid Response Grant. Got it. And then um, the drug treatment. Yeah, that drug-free communities grant uh, <coughs> is exactly what uh, CFO Marinaccio is talking about with regards to uh, federal uh, audit requirements, and it, it totally is different and much more complex uh, accountability mm -hmm. process that you have to go through administratively on a periodic basis to continue to be available for this grant, correct? And you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, I think 
Brian, I think there's some sort of training, I hope, on all of it. But um, yeah, I mean, they are. absolutely. It's I a mean, heavy load. It's a, it's a very heavy load. The reporting I've heard consistently is, is takes up quite a bit of time. Um, any change we make, even minor changes, needs a form that needs to be submitted into the system and it needs to be approved. And I think you know, you and I just talked about how on November 1st you need to submit something um, about how you're the authorized organization representative, I'm the program director, even though that's already in the system. So we can already see it's going to be um, a lot of that type of request yeah. from the federal government. Yeah. Okay. So our goal, just to continue to expand upon our existing program, um, really focusing on our youth, <coughs> collecting data, that's, that's a big, big gap. I'm very eager to get those surveys going in the school system so we can see what's happening. Um, and then develop and implement that mentorship program I mentioned, explore opportunities for life space for our youth drop-in center. That was one of the identified areas we need when we did our community survey. Um, really expand our prevention services, as one of those saying, and then just continue our uh, increased outreach to community entities. Um, well, I'm glad you're doing this because everything I hear, teenage drug use is up big time in a lot of areas and uh, the availability you know like I was telling you today those pills that they found 12,000 pills in California today uh, that they were going to be uh, with fentanyl in them they were going to be uh, handing them out at Halloween yeah. and uh, th this it just really terrifies me about what's going on mm -hmm. and how readily available a lot of this stuff is mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know whether a dog found it or what I never heard but it was just amazing that they were able to find that 12,000 pills. But I'm just very worried about this, and and the amount of vaping too still con concerns me a lot. And uh, I don't know. And then now we got another smoke shop in town, and uh, just uh, it's just very, very concerning. I'm glad you're, you're you're working on this. It's a great thing to do because I, I don't see it stopping, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and now we actually have the resources to, yeah. to do the program. Yeah, and I'm glad you're going to be able to work with the schools, and I think that's going to be a big advantage, and I'm hoping that they'll reciprocate and let you in and work with you hand in glove. Yeah, they've been they've been awesome, and I think now that a lot of the COVID restrictions have been lifted, the whole time frame that I've been here, mm -hmm. even with some since COVID, so um, we just partnered with them on an assembly, and I just had a meeting there in person the other day, Good. so they're very much, and like I mentioned, NBA is um, all on board with, well, that's where it starts, because I taught middle school for a long time, and that's really where it starts. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then just lastly, teacher department needs. Um, definitely a confidential and accessible programming space for us. Um, New York City funds are just challenges in that regard. And then I have it for a plug in commercial fund resources coordinator this week. And I'll leave it to use the budget time for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> You know, she's at 28 hours, and um, we're lucky to have her at 28 hours, but I think, you know, it is definitely something we need to consider that most people won't work for 28 hours, right, because they want benefits, and so I have to consider if, you know, my current staff were to leave, um, yep. you know, would I be able to fill a 28-hour-a-week position? Probably not, so... Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for. Uh, no, thank you for the update. Good we appreciate job. it. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's amazing leadership. I think you've done great yeah, things. It's a great summary. News, right? And um, you know, this is a lot of hard work though to get to this point. So I mean, we appreciate what you're doing, and uh, I think the residents appreciate it. And uh, yeah, you still have a big job ahead of you. It's yeah, the work's not done. No, it's not. <laughs> Seems like more hard work creates more hard work. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. The next on the agenda is a request uh, from the fire department to hire uh, Aaron Gately. Nope. No, I'm sorry, to uh, Mr. Clinton hire uh, Clinton Thomas for part-time firefighter a EMT. Is this correct that it would be 11-7 on that? Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, okay. It's just a, it's a vacancy, right? We have yeah. funding for a vacancy. Exactly. So we, we have well, a there's also a write-up on this that explains yeah. that. Uh, yeah. So we have an opening for a medic. 
So I assume if they're hiring this, they're not trying to fill a part-time medic position. Or is this, rep do I have somebody on my listing that's not with us anymore and I don't know about it? This fire fighter EMT. Um, right. Mm -hmm. right. This is not a position, but I don't know what, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. We, yeah, we had one open medic part-time position. So I mean, if, if they're hiring for EMT, that's fine. That'll carry the way. I'm just. But um, that's what it says. But it says EMT. Right. So I'm saying that we won't. We'll be full at that point. There won't be any vacancies. Oh, okay. So we'll be looking for a still a, ma a medic. Okay. Great. Uh, he's very qualified. I know him. I think it's a great hire sure. and uh, I'm in favor of it. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we need a motion for this. Should I make a motion to hire Quentin Thomas, uh, the part time firefighter EMT, at uh, the hourly rate of $22.06 as presented with a start date of 11 7 22. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Camp IFO. Final report recommendations. Hot off the press. Good evening, Todd Rowan, Director of Public Works. Uh, first up is the Camp IFO Ad Hoc Committee Final Report, which was finalized uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, this uh, board selection had charged this Ad Hoc Committee with three charges, the first of which is to address the city issues at the park. Um, we, uh, we got a robust group, many different interested parties, uh, different town kind of staff, and we came up for, with recommendations to address the security issues. The first is to uh, make the Camp IFO or the uh, Perch Lake side of the Camp Road a no parking area uh, along the, uh, the lake itself. Uh, this will provide access to the boat launch and the dry hydrant and ensure clear passage for traffic along the dam in that area. Second recommendation is to keep the uh, brush cut back around the stone wall, wall bordering the field, uh, cut it more frequently, and keep the, uh, the property in a well kept condition. We will, uh, DPW will be doing some work up there this winter to open up the sight lines along the water and some of the underbrush that's been growing up. Uh, and a third recommendation is to change some of the signage in and around the, uh, the trailhead uh, because we have three very large signs that are basically dumped. Um, and then we have smaller signs throughout the park and we want to kind of consolidate those and put them at trailheads at either end of the, uh, particularly the blue trail, uh, but also the parking lot and also in the beach area so that everybody accessing the area will know what our rules are. Uh, fourth recommendation was uh, asking the, the Board of Selectmen to develop a community education campaign within different various town media outlets and explaining the rules and voicing uh, a comment by public, public officials to promote and support the rigorous enforcement of drug, alcohol, marijuana, leash laws, fires, uh, and other safety uh, concerns. Well, we cleaned that place up three or four years ago, and I couldn't believe it. <coughs> oh, the nips. Well, that's all over everything. I, but, I, but I'm serious. I, I think I got an entire bag of nips. I think that's changed now. They've got a uh, money that comes spurring on them. <laughs> you make money, you get some money. I still uh, find them in my front yard. <laughs> but uh, it hasn't changed the use. Oh. It doesn't change that. And they're not mine. They're not yours, no. Okay. Um, so that's what they're sending you? They're not yours? No. <laughs> the, uh, the fifth recommendation was that of a caretaker, which we'll talk about in the next um, charge. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the sixth. Um, is really about the uh, the swimming versus no swimming. Um, we've had, we've been operating in kind of a gray area or no man's land, so to speak, where the state position is either you don't allow swimming or you allow swimming. Now it can be without lifeguards, but it's one or the other. It's not in between. What we what Summers has done since we acquired the property, uh, we do have it posted that the water's not tested and there's no lifeguards on duty. However, if we're going to allow swimming. Um, then there are certain regulations we have to comply with through DPH, which is testing the water once a week, combing the beach every day, providing trash tanks, providing uh, bathrooms. Uh, because we allow fishing, there has to be a, a combed off or roped off area for swimming. There has to be life preservers available, which we would take in every every night. Um, so there's some regulations which are attached to this passage. I think it's one of the last pages that um, 
I had reached out to the sanitarian and she had gotten the regulation from DPH and was specified there. Um, sanitary survey must be completed at the beginning of each season. Weekly water testing, lifeguard signage, and no lifeguard on duty with emergency contact numbers. Each morning, the beach needs to be inspected for hazards. No boat launching or fishing in the swimming area. Uh, on site pilot facilities with signage. Floors must be treated with sanitizer each day. Uh, no domestic animals allowed in and around the swimming area. There must be uh, inflatable blinds or lights. I'm sorry, inflatable blinds or lights are not allowed or alcoholic beverages. And that'll have to be signed. Um, so, so it, is it recommended? Yes, to swim yeah, or no, just not to swim? Because it's not that clear here. It's follow the DPH guidelines uh, from the uh, committee. We understand there'll be a cost to that, there'll be a cost to construct the well, what I envision is a small masonry mill and female bathroom with a storage area for all the accoutrements mm -hmm. of the beach. Um, probably closer to the parking lot so we could avail ourselves of the existing septic system and wells. Uh, but the infrastructure, the underground infrastructure is already there. I will have to check the septic, but I think it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll have to incorporate some money or find some grants to build some kind of a bathroom. And then there's going to be a maintenance component. And what, what do you think the expense would be on the bathroom? A small building, a masonry building. Yeah. I'm hoping it's thirty thousand dollars or something like that, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars. You know, a couple, you know, just a single toilet and sink or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty modest. It's not, it's not a huge area. So we do want to need it. You want a beach and just a small closet or something. Um, okay. Masonry block is pretty vandal resistant. So metal doors, things like that. But all of it. Uh, the second charge uh, for the um, Hypo Ad Hoc Committee was to analyze, assess, and determine the best usage, usage of the park using all available data, including the 2015 ISO survey and the 2021 survey of residents. Uh, we did look at those surveys, um, and there was a range of different options and a lot of discussion around this, as you can uh, imagine. The biggest one right now, we kind of envision this really as a phased approach. The funding is certainly the hottest topic and certainly has been since COVID and, and even before that. And we believe we should allow swimming there. Uh, no lifeguards, but at least allow swimming and, and comply with DPH's recommendation. Um, after that, uh, we really think to do it successfully, we should look at a park keeper or um, a, uh, a park host. Army Corps of Engineers has a really interesting program throughout the country where, where if you're, it tends to be retired folks, have an RV, they, mm -hmm. they live down south in the winter, and then they travel the, the country in the summertime between May and basically September, and they'll be a, a park host, whereas they're not charged any rent, but they're allowed to stay in parks and they travel all over, and this would be one of them. There's a park not far from here, over the border, border Mass, very similar, it's a little greater than ours, but similar idea. And, there, and there's a guy there that is the park host, and he, he opens and closes the gates every day. He moves the beaches, empties the trash, cleans the bathrooms, what have you. And he's also there as a, an, an official, a town official, town employee, for people to go to questions. And if you have somebody walking around with a, I don't know, a vest or something, that will probably get rid of most of your vandalism. Say 90% of your vandalism. Mm -hmm. and, and Dogs not on leash and things like that. And he would also have a, a phone hook up to be able to call the police if they if need be. So just having a presence up there, we feel, would, would eliminate a lot of the issues we've had in the past. Um, and this would be generally May to September, you know, in the height of the season. Typically Memorial Day, Labor Day, it could be extended on either side a little bit. But we think if we constructed a concrete pad with a dump station for an RV and some, you know, power and communication hookups, um, which we could do fairly inexpensively. And then shop out. There's an entire industry around this, and there's many different websites for these people with campers that uh, just travel around and seem to love this. Um, so we think this could be a real win for the town at a very, very low cost. Um, and just having somebody up there, we would then really look at putting a gate on the parking lot uh, and closing that off um, at dark. Yeah. I know it works because I, I, I ran into these people when we were at Yellowstone. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's, it's something that, yeah. and some they just go from place to place. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, sometimes they go south and they, yeah. Yeah. So they don't necessarily have So I think it's a great plan. Um, we would come up with a contract that has to go through the attorneys and you would have to agree on mm -hmm. um, But we think that's probably the best way to go as a phased approach. And then 
finally, the, uh, the next thing would be down the road looking at some kind of facility. Um, basically in the idea of where Avery Hall was, where the fireplace is up on the hill, that we could use to direct and run some programming out of their um, community groups, perhaps even the schools. Right now we can't bring a group of kids up there because there's no safe place to be. If there's bad weather, there's no base of operations, you're just out in the wilderness. So you really need a facility that you can house everybody in. They can bring their lunches, what have you, do bathrooms, maybe an office, a large room, um, and then they can do maybe not <coughs> full-fledged camps, but maybe as an add-on to our day camps that we're going to go up to the park for a couple of days, up to Iowa for a couple of days, and other groups could use it. We don't think this type of facility should really be let out uh, to rent, at least initially, because uh, other towns do that, but then you get into having to have some kind of staff there and, and security and cleaning, whereas if we're just community groups, just initially just for the town and perhaps the schools, and then maybe letting out the community groups like the Boy Scouts. And um, there we've had a lot of interest from Boy Scouts, particularly and also the Girl Scouts have done some projects up there um, where they would be interested in a facility like this. But we have to be very well controlled and part of our building use policy. But that's down the road. That's you know, there's tens of thousands of dollars to build something like that. We're looking at it as a phased approach. First is allow swimming, build the bathrooms, incorporate the, the caretaker, and then see how that goes. And kind of do one step at a time and see how things go. Um, because the vast majority of the facility is, is hiking. It's open space, it's woods, it's forest. It's the, it's the field, it's the beach, the parking area that we're kind of focused on. The rest of it will pretty much remain the same with your hiking trails and what have you. Um, third charge was to recommend funding opportunities. Um, and we had a lot of discussions about this. There's some models we looked at, um, you know, charging for parking or having seasons passes for town residents and charging a different fee for our town residents. That's a that's a model that a lot of towns use. Uh, we talked about charging for any access, which is probably impossible because there's so many just walking in. You can't you can't prohibit that. Both because of the uh, the, the lawsuit that happened about 20 years ago in Keokuk County, and also because of the the deed restrictions on this property doesn't allow it. It has to be open to the public <coughs> from, any, from any state, from anywhere. So we, we felt perhaps charging for parking would be a way to go, but then you have to staff that. Yeah. So initially our thinking right now is the operation of this park is going to fall in town and the taxpayers, yeah. as we're proposing the beaches and swimming, you know, and caretaker. Caretaker could open and close the gate, but off season we would probably leave the gate open because we would staff it. And frankly, in the wintertime, it's it's fairly well used, but it's people are using the hiking trails and not even a lot of them. So the right. fishermen <laughs> use it all the time. But there's Nobody skates on it? Nobody skates on it? Well, it's been I a while since we had enough ice to skate yeah, on it. Yeah, but I just, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, if, yeah. if, the, if it was warm, if, if we had a winter, if we had a winter that you could actually ice, do yeah, that. Yeah, people do skate. I mean, it's, it's, it's rough. <laughs> No, I, I was just curious. I was just curious if, if some, you know. Sure, they do, and we've talked about we could have a, you know, a holiday festival up there if the winter was cold mm -hmm. enough and there was enough ice to, ice to support that. Maureen has some ideas about. They're that. already saying this coming winter is going to be below warmer. Yeah, but they say that every year. Yeah, but well, <laughs> that's been the trend for the last several years. Yeah. Because of climate change. Yeah, you know, when I was eight or nine years old, I used to ice fish on that sure. pond. Yeah, it was great. Well, back in the day, you could harvest ice. On the parking thing, um, I know I've, I, you go to New Hampshire in March and April and so forth, and, and I'm up there, and when you go to their hiking trails, they just have a box. Kiosk. Yeah. And then, yeah, exactly, a kiosk, you take a slip, you put your $5 inside of your tear tag, and you hang it from your yep. from your. we could do that, yeah. Um, I think rather than having to staff it, it's on an honor system. I yeah. mean, some people are yeah. going to do it, some aren't. Right. Um, and I would do that. Not full proof, but it saves you a ton of money like and the that, you know, cost of having to staff it. You just leave some envelopes there. Yeah, no, I definitely, we, were, we discussed it a lot. And it's just the cost of staffing, it probably wouldn't recover just the cost of staffing no. until staff no. why you're doing it. So yeah. I, I don't know that there's a real hot spot for that. It's beyond the intent of the original. You're not going to be able to ticket anybody for not paying because we don't really have a parking ordinance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And well, yeah. not for hiking. Not for hiking. Not my wife and I don't. Oh, not for hiking. But and the, only, and the only place we could do it is in the parking area, the town land. We couldn't do it on the rest of it, which mm -hmm. is under the, the deed restriction of the grant. And, and even that, there's there's bills every year in front of the legislature to make that illegal for 
towns with even charge of parking. You know, what are those only, I don't know. I personally, I don't think, I really don't think there's anything there, honestly. I would like to see a keeper. We could put a gate in the parking lot. They could open and close it. You know, open in the morning, close it at night during the season, the busy season of the summer. For the rest of it, just leave it open. Um, I would like to put cameras in the bathrooms and maybe put cameras in the keeper's area. Yeah. So at least the police can have it right on the phone. They can look and check it out. Um, Definitely. And then par perhaps a, <laughs> you have a lot of questions about this, uh, a pay phone. I don't know if they make them anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> well, uh, and they have them in the England. The cell service yeah. up there is yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, so some kind of, we would have some kind of hookup for, for the keepers <coughs> that on off times, maybe a pay phone or emergency phone on the side of the bathroom or something. I, I don't Pay phone <laughs> <laughs> there was one. On, there was one on uh, 44 in, in Manchester for a while. I don't know if it's still there. It can't be. It was right on center. It was oh. like a monument. It's like a museum item. Well, so I saw one in North Conway when we were up last month too. Oh yes, there is one in North Conway. <laughs> my kids had no clue. I, I know that not everybody would be in favor of this, but when I where I grew up in Massachusetts. We, you know, we had a lake and you had the beach and you had a family beach pass. Right. And uh, that then was the reason why it was good was because it paid for the lifeguards and it paid for somebody to take care of the beach and we actually, they actually had, you know, some sand brought in and, you know, actually created a beach. So it might be something to think about. Well, since that decision in Fairfield about 20 years ago, you can't exclude people. You can, you can charge for parking. Yeah. But if we do go down that road of charging for access to the park, yeah, we're very likely going to lose that. Yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Is that restricted? That was Fairfield County used to restrict um, access to one. Right. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of those those uh, uh, towns that have access to the oceans and stuff like yeah. that have all sorts of rules. So I didn't know it applied. Well, they used to, but they lost them. I, I didn't know right. that uh, that applied to a situation like that. Yes. Well, for two reasons: one, because of lawsuits, and two, because the grant that we used to acquire this property yeah. specifically says it's past the property is public. Yeah. It's public domain. Oh, okay. So, we, 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 so we you couldn't you, you couldn't do it as it because yeah. other people can come in. All right. right, it has to be open every day. All right, okay, thank you. So All that right. is the, the gist. There was a uh, an example that one of our, our members had given about a funding opportunity, looking at possibly closing Camp Road and getting it on either side, maybe using some of those uh, six other lots that were carved out um, that are building lots that could be used in some fashion or sold perhaps to generate revenue. The group really didn't like the idea of selling those lots. Um, and this came up originally when we acquired the property. Right. The residents really didn't idea. want to sell it. They wanted to leave it all as open space. But they're still there and they're still carved yeah. out. Um, the closing Camp Road, we'd have to just continue it as a road. From a security point, I love the idea. Put gates on either end and, and fix a lot of the problem. Oh, yeah. From a practical aspect, and I'm not sure, we have to get DEP involved in <coughs> assess claims violating the Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think this is not this is not a recommendation. This no, map. No. The, uh, and this, no, uh, that was just an idea this, uh, that we thought this, we would include. Uh, it's not a financial uh, thing, which is. It's not, no, because then you got to staff it to get into all that. I, I don't know well, the this numbers, the numbers, are, numbers aren't even. No, the numbers don't work either. So it's, it's, it was here's an idea. Yeah. It doesn't really work, but we thought it would, we'd be remiss if we didn't include anything. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you got some really great short term recommendations that could be accomplished. And we'll let DPW will start implementing the cleaning and the signage we can do. I'll, I'll look at uh, what it will cost to do uh, uh, some bathrooms up there and comply with DPH for swimming. And I'll it's a bathroom. terrific resource the town is to yeah. um, The recommendation number four, the selectmen should develop the community. I mean, I don't think the selectmen here are going to be developing that. <laughs> Uh, I was. I, could you gather a? Could you gather a component of that committee uh, to come up with uh, something like that? Well, it's really talking about the do's and don'ts of it, the allowed and not allowed. Right. It's already posted on the sign. It's more of a media campaign of probably putting it out in, in the Summit Connect magazine. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah summer, something on the town website, website. Put it on Facebook, things like that. Just to re hey, remind, remember, yeah. this is what you can and can't do up there. That was the intent. <coughs> I hope oh. all those people that go in there from Massachusetts know that, and I'm not trying to pick on them, because I see a lot of people up there from Massachusetts. 
true. And, I don't, the, and the I don't, argument and are is they the two ones, miles away. And are, the, are they the ones that throw all the trash? Uh, you know, I, I don't the, know. That yeah, we don't know. Most that. of the people yeah. that hike are not yeah. people that they pick up trash. Yeah, but I, I'm just saying, you know, the people throwing toilets in there and all sorts of other stuff. It's, it's just, I couldn't, I was stunned a few years ago how much, you know, it, it, people were just using it as a, as a dump. They use any unoccupied area as a dump. We pick up trash on Dirty Rod at least once a month. We so, pick up trash it's all, you, you see it more than I do, yeah. then, huh? It's, it's, it, you can't single out any group. It's just, it happens everywhere. I mean, it just, it is what it is. So, okay. we, can we expect to get, here's some, some recommendations from you in the future as to what? Yes, as far as uh, really a funding, one, funding requests for the bathrooms. And, right. And because it's really about building the bathrooms, I'll get uh, numbers together on. on uh, um, and the reception facility for the the, uh, the person that's there in the summer. Right, right. Build, pouring a pad and putting a dump station right. in place. Right. Phone, connect, phone, phone connection. Phone connection. Yeah. And then we'll kind of model the uh, the idea of a keeper on what. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has this great special idea. program, yeah. and then um, I'll bring that to you as well as a draft and, yeah, right. it, uh, so, and see. So a couple things, Ted. Number one, thanks for this. Nice job with the timeline. I know it was tight. I think there's some great ideas here. I think this is going to be a good blueprint for the next three, five years, you know, for CIP and for a lot of others. What's the intention of the committee going forward? I mean, are we going to dissolve it yes. or yeah. so just Unless dissolve it? it okay. the, the idea They've done their to, job. To dissolve okay. the yeah. committee and they're done. And the committee's fine with that. There's yeah. no need for them to continue we, on. We adjourned at our last meeting with no intention of meeting again. Okay. Okay. Four or five <laughs> who would, well, who would pick this up then? Open Space and Trails would pick this up? As far as which part? Well, just a follow through. Because there's obviously a lot of follow through. I mean, this is a one time report, but it's a living right. document and. You the know. security is going to be addressed by my, myself and the, and the public safety. Um, the coming back to you with pricing on building a bathroom, I'll, so I'll do that yeah. as well. Okay. The, the keeper's cabin and the keeper's idea would be that. As far as long-term goals, it would be the board of selectmen and also the open space and trails, which is yeah. half of the members are part of open space. Well, it seems like, it seems logical that they yeah. would maybe. So. Yes. Okay. It comes up every night. I, I, yeah. I oppose our biggest topic of open space and trails. That's what we talk about. Material so maybe we just fold the discussion here into that group. And okay. You guys did a great job with thank it, you. so thank you. Thanks very much, Todd. Thank you. Great job. Next on the agenda is the uh, request to hire uh, Richard uh, Gavro for an on-call plow operator maintainer position with an hourly rate of twenty-five dollars. Oh uh, yeah. What would be the start public. date on that? October 24th? October 24th. That's what it says in the paper. Yeah, yeah right. it's in the memo. Yep. Okay. October 24th. Yeah, the, uh, Richard had applied uh, previously. He's an Air Force uh, veteran, former Har Hartford Firefighter EMT. He has a commercial driver's license, truck driving, snow removal, and heavy equipment experience. Uh, just 20 years in the Air Force, I think, um, as I recall. Uh, he lives in town. We think he'd be a good, uh, good candidate to fill this open position. This would fill out our um, plow operators. We all, I put maintainer because we also do call these guys in, not just for plowing, but occasionally when we when we need help, roadside mowing, driving a dump truck if we're doing a big project, things of that nature. And it's worked out really well. Our, our seasonal guys have really helped us out uh, filling some holes in staff. And uh, so we like to, to bring them on for, for any need that we have. But it, it all comes out of the, the budget. Uh, amount in the DPW budget for on call and seasonal help. Makes sense. We need a motion for this? <coughs> yep. I'd be happy to make a motion to uh, approve the hiring of Richard, uh, how do you pronounce his name? Gavro. Gavro to the position of a on call plow operator maintainer sure. at a pay rate of $25 an hour with a start date of October 21st, 2023. Second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion passed. Thank, Thank you, you. Todd. Uh, next, I've got a uh, request to sell uh, SF equipment. Um, we want to change this request. Uh, the first one is a DPW uh, small plow truck. We've taken delivery of a new one. We would like to uh, sell that one by way of uh, online auction, dogdeals.com, which, by the way, we just sold one of our other excess uh, small plow trucks in the, uh, the money that we got for it was staggering, frankly. <laughs> um, $14,000. I thought it was five, but uh, it shows you the state of the market. Well, it's good considering because how much is going to cost to buy a new one, right? Well, yeah, we have already taken delivery of one. Yeah, so okay. considerably more than that. But um, you know, these are these are excess and old and, and 
So there's no need for this anywhere in the town. We're not going to no. get a request in the next two years to buy a. Not for this truck. No, we're taking it out of service. It's just sitting there. Now. And the same with the police car. Both of them. We're not going to get a request the for. The police car. We might to uh, pull back that request on the police. Cruiser. Okay. Um, we had a after I had sent this to you guys. Um, we had a request from town hall to hold on to the police cruiser for now. Okay. Take a hard look at maybe using this as a pool car. Right okay. Now we have. We have a 20 year old explorer that has zero issues that we're holding on to for the time being until it dies, and then we have the van. And with the amount of staff between here and social services, um, we don't have enough vehicles okay. for, for staff. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to hold on to this Thanks, new car and, and move it over to the town hall pool. Good. Um, Good. Great. Okay. Do we need a motion to sell the, uh, the truck? 2006 uh, pickup truck. Right. I have to make a motion to sell the 2006 F-350 DPW truck. Second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. Local traffic authority requests. Uh, last is the request from a resident to um, change the passing zone on Springfield Road into a no passing zone. Uh, this board at their last meeting had uh, directed myself and Tim Liddick, the police administrator, to take a look at this request. Um, our, I believe you have copies of our reports. Uh, at Public Works, we took a look at Tibby Road, the adjoining road, and found it uh, compliant with the MUTCD and the DOT. Um, traffic markings are correct. Sight lines are good. Um, and then uh, also, Tim would like to speak to the, uh, the police report uh, about Springfield Road. Speak of the microphone. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we uh, put the uh, request, you know, for traffic study. We put the uh, speed trailer up uh, on Route 83 Springfield Road section, uh, just south of Tippy Grove Road, uh, for 18 days. Um, over 32,307 vehicles. Uh, speeds range from 20 to 99 miles an hour. <laughs> You might just explain that. I found that interesting that some people like to lay up the sign and take a picture as right. they go yeah. through it. They can yeah. take the sign. Yeah. 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 Bizarre. Is that a cheap yeah. thrill? Send it to their friend. Yeah. Does it register though? They have a background of this. Yeah. So if they were doing 90, do we get that data or does it just we get say data. it was 60? We get the data. So we get the data uh, to collect from 20 miles oh, an yeah. hour up to 100. Oh, okay. Um, but it won't now show higher than Now we're only going to flash it up to 60 miles yeah. an hour. So Makes like sense. yesterday or two days ago we put it on uh, Kinney Road, it will only flash up to 60. Yeah. It will collect the data over that though. Cool. Yep. Uh, Great. Uh, basically we found yeah. the speed, uh, the posted speed limit is 40 miles an hour. Uh, the average speed of it was 32,000 cars over 18 days. It's uh, just under 42, 41.92 miles mm. per hour. Wow. Uh, crashes in the past three years from September, excuse me, uh, October 1st, 2019 to October 1st of uh, this year. Uh, two car accidents, both no injuries, both were in uh, 2019, the end of 2019. Uh, so not really seeing that there is uh, any correlation with the passing zone area um, in conjunction with um, what we've studied. So you both your recommendations is that as is, there's no, there's no issue that we've seen. We did a pretty comprehensive study Correct. There's no compelling reason to request the DOT change it to a no passing zone other than the resident's request. Yeah. We don't see any data to support Very good. Uh, however, as a legal graphical authority, we could, we could okay. still send it to the DOT. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, thorough uh, approach to this and uh, very professionally done and I think answers all the questions. It gives us targeted uh, speed trail data. It also gives us, um, you know, reports of, you know, like rush hour, evening rush hour, so between 3 and 7 p.m. or the the highest, so we can do specific targeted enforcement. Yeah, have our makes sense. There. People often use their driveways to do that. Yeah. Um, so we have increased our enforcement in that area. So we would send the resident a letter just saying we've done a study and that mm -hmm. just briefly summarize the results and yeah, I mean, I think we just take no action then, right? I mean, yeah. I don't mm -hmm. want to send something to the DOT if there's no nothing to support it. In my opinion, no. they will 
Yeah, I think it's just a, it's just a, a waste of time. Waste of time. Yeah. Okay. To do. I think as long as we follow up with a letter to yeah. the resident, then we've we've done our due diligence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Nice job. Yeah. Next on the agenda is the uh, approval of minutes from October 6, 2022. 6 p.m. meeting, regular meeting. Make a motion to accept the minutes as presented. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passed. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank adjourn. you. Adjourn. Thank you.